Today on Stark Talk Special Edition, I've got co-host Chuck Nice and Gary O'Reilly, and we brought in our geek in chief, the one and only Charles Liu, because we talk about all kinds of things like our experience with time relative to a beam of light. We also talk about what our favorite objects were in Star Trek that came true. What else? We also wonder what direction should you launch a rocket? Is it straight up or is it sideways? That and more coming up on Star Talk Special Edition. This is Star Talk Special Edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And as always, for these editions, we got Gary O'Reilly. Gary. Yeah. Hey, Neil. Good uh, to be here again. Professional footballer and mm -hmm. professional announcer. And yes. thank you to, to the soccer universe for lending you to us. Well, that's very kind of you. Yeah, and we got Chuck. Nice, Chuck. Always good to hey, see you, man. That's right. And to the professional soccer universe, you're not getting them back. <laughs> we got them. <laughs> we got them now. You suckers, you and, lost. And so this is a grab bag cosmic queries. Anytime the grab bag goes everywhere, guys, we got to pull out the big guns. Ooh. All right. We we open the shed and we pull out. <laughs> we, pull, we pull out the one, the only. Undisputed, Charles Liu. <laughs> Charles yeah. Liu, friend, friend and colleague. He's a professor of astronomy and physics at the City University of New York, based in Staten Island, and he's with the Graduate Center there. And he's got a podcast called the Universe, yes, which, which yes. showcases uh, <laughs> up and coming science talent. We yeah. need some of that on this landscape. So, oh, absolutely, see that happening. And so, here's what happens: you, you if you don't know Charles. He will bail us out of anything we don't otherwise know. That That's works right. Every time, because he's the geek in chief. That's right. Uh, the geek all in hail, chief. all hail, Charles Cocktail Party Lou. Because if there's <laughs> anything you want to know, he's the guy at the cocktail party that knows everything. That's right, right. And I count myself high among the ranks of in the geekiverse, but in the geekiverse, the scale is infinite. <laughs> so, <laughs> however far I am. You, the, you can be geekier, and that's the man in the studio right now. Okay, so you, this is a cosmic queries, or just queries. It's a special edition. So, so Gary, uh, uh, Chuck, what? Who's first? Go ahead, I'll Gary. go first. All right. Okay, Gary, okay. go for this, it. These are from our Patreon audience, and we love them and bless them for their curiosity. And this is Chris Hampton's question: Could it be that our perpetual experience of time is because of our perpetual movement through? The fabric of space time. Ooh, I like that. Ooh. Mm. So, Charles, Basically. let me add to that. If nothing yeah. moved in the universe, mm -hmm. would we have any perception of time at all? We would. But it's ah. a strange, strange concept, right? Because as it turns out, many people will say when one interpretation of the special theory of relativity, which talks about space and traveling through space and traveling through time, is that everything is always moving at the speed of light. But... It's speed of light, not through regular three space, but through four dimensional space time. So you and I, we move through space and we have mass, we have space time, and we're moving sort of at equivalent of the speed of light. A photon, which is a piece of light, has no mass, and it's moving always at the speed of light also. So in a sense, uh, in this four dimensional way of thinking, instead of a three dimensional way of thinking, we are mm -hmm. all always moving at the speed of light. But light itself is moving through space faster than we are moving through space only. So this perception of time is always a matter of what we perceive based on where we are and how we're moving through three-dimensional space, but also four-dimensional space time. Why am I more okay. confused than- I was than gonna say, first of all, <laughs> I hate to do this, but you gotta tell me why are we always moving at the speed of light? Cause I know that's what everybody is asking right now. Right now, what do you mean right this you minute. Say, why right. are we always moving at the speed of the speed of light? And translated from Chuck, what were you smoking before you began? To do <laughs> okay, that's smoking my Chuck a translation of, right there. A little bit of Albert Einstein, 1905. Okay. Right. Um, think about it this way, if you are, traveling, say, in one dimension, you measure how many, say, miles per hour you're going along in, the in road. In a straight line. Right? In a straight okay. line, right. right. 
But if you're moving in two dimensions, say you're moving diagonally, like, like an airplane, right? Moving up diagonally during takeoff, it's moving both in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. And when you at take the same the, time. Yeah, yeah. And so when you take the combination of those, then you wind up with a new velocity vector. And the amount of speed you're going doesn't look the same as either right along the ground or vertically upward. Right. right? So it's okay. adding this vector thing. Now imagine space time being that. Space is the horizontal axis. Time, a fourth dimension, shall we say, is so, a vertical. So axis. all three dimensions of space are this one axis right now. It's one axis. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now collapse time them all together. The, time being now the vertical axis. Exactly. Right. Right. Or, or the fourth dimension. Or okay. correct. Uh, okay. Let's okay. keep going. Yes. So now go. See, it's not that hard. It so, wasn't. No, no, we ain't done no. yet. <laughs> done. Don't be saying it ain't hard yet. No, no. Done. Go ahead. It, then, then you do the same kind of thing where you use kind of like a Pythagorean theorem, right? For right. what space time does in terms of measuring distances and velocities and so forth. And so you wind up with the velocity that is what the speed of light would be just through space. So we all, everything is moving at that same velocity, but depending on how we're moving through space, we also move through time a little bit differently. That vector, which toggles back and forth between the vertical and the horizontal is always constant. Wait, wait, so wait, just hold on. So if we're just sitting here having this conversation, yes. we are moving in time. Time. Yep. And so our, our we're moving like vertically right now in time. Yes. We're not really going anywhere. You know what yes. right. right. Okay, so now light is moving not only in time, but also in space. Space. Yes. So now it's mm -hmm. got, let's call it a 45 degree angle up there. Oh, that's the difference. See, light has no mass, right. so it's always going horizontally only. Right. It so, actually. So since it had okay. Right. All right. So now wait a minute. Okay. So now, so light particles don't actually age. All right, we get we that. Age we age. So they're sit. constantly in the present. Yes. In their own exactly. present. Exactly. Well, no, in, in, in their, in their, own, their present. own present. Oh, That's no. right. right. So you know, but, long ago. Now, here's the thing, though. Wait, wait, let you the just... man fit. Wait, wait. Okay, no, go, okay. Ahead, go ahead. Okay, go no, ahead. No, that's fine. This, that's fine. No, this is crazy. No, I, I love going, it. Yeah, no, the, one of the hypotheses that was trying to decipher whether or not the cosmological redshift was actually expansion of the universe or not right. was something proposed many decades ago uh, by people like Fred Hoyle, uh, who suggested that maybe the reason we see cosmological redshift, the, the mm -hmm. things moving, you know, things appearing redder expansion than they the actually universe. are. Yeah, yes, right. exactly. Not expansion, but just that light as it travels, it gets tired. Right. It loses energy as it moves, almost as if it had mass. That was, the tired light, that, that, that yeah, was okay. called the tired light hypothesis. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. and, but does and it so, still travel at the speed of light if it, if it now sort of denuded its way through? Ah, really what right, Gary so, just said is, what is redshifting? <laughs> that's yeah. really what he just said right thank you that, that's for another time but basically right. it's the way the cos the cosmos moves it expands yeah. throughout right what used yeah. to be tiny is now huge but as far as relativity goes and how our motion through space-time goes right we are this way and vertical. light is that way horizontal. Right? vertical horizontal okay. and we wind wow. up with this kind so who's of going who's thing? going at an angle between us we do when we move. When we move. Right. right. Got it. Okay. If we're on a spaceship or on an airplane right. or something like that, we are going back. Then there's an angle right. because we're not yeah. only moving because in space, but also in time. Because right. okay. we're going yes. up and, and horizontal, and, and at, and the horizontal. Mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. Okay. Right. All right. That's why, that's why one of my uh, college professors who really understood this super well explained to all of us that you can do special relativity using hyperbolic trigonometry. And he always thought, well, that was much oh, well, easier. Well, who doesn't and, know yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, who does on. that, right? Yeah. Who, who, I mean, who doesn't do that? <laughs> <laughs> which, which was cool, uh, but I never quite understood it so well. So, wow. uh, All right. Well, Dude, you're making me feel cool. good, Charles, because if you don't quite understand it, <laughs> I feel in a better place. This is a yeah. tough thing, guys. All right, let's yeah, get to the next one. What's the next all question? Right, all right, here we go. That was crazy, by the way. That, that was crazy. That was it was pretty, crazy. That was, that was that was good crazy. That was crazy good. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Just, question. wait, wait just, question. To, just to put the nail in this coffin. All right, go ahead. So, Charles, <laughs> isn't it just being provocative to say we are moving at the speed of light? What you're saying is we're moving at our natural speed through time, whatever we want to call that. Light yes. is moving at its natural speed through space. 
But to say we are moving at the speed of light, that's a little needlessly provocative, it seems to me. It might be. That kind of phrasing probably is an attention-grabbing device more than anything else. Yeah. But it also implies with it a need for you to understand what it means to move through space time Correct. It compared forced me to what it that. means to move Very through good. space. It forced yeah, me yeah. to think about that differently. Exactly. Because right. I'm naturally just moving forward in time at one yeah. second per second. And That's the light is naturally going right. through space, not aging at all. We're just right. doing our thing. However, right. what it did do for me was it allowed me to visualize the axes that yeah. you were talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's mm -hmm. really what it did. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. all right, cool. All right. All right. This Next is Chuck. Kevin the Kevin the Sommelier, and okay. Kevin the Sommelier oh. says, "Glad the Luniverse is here." Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. He says, "If we the are the Luniverse able to, has landed, the Luniverse, the Luniverse has landed." Has landed. <laughs> If we are able to achieve warp capability one day, will we experience time dilation in accordance to Einstein's general relativity? Mm -hmm. If Star Trek is correct, they age at the same rate as Starfleet in San Francisco. P.S. Neil, get your hands on some Hartford Old Vine Zinfandel from Russian River. Oh, nice. Ooh, nice. Russian okay. River. Actually, love Russian Napa's River. Napa's not cool enough anymore? <laughs> <laughs> no, Russian River do does it right, and Old Vines can't argue with that. Love Old Vines. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah, All right. Well, well, Kevin, the, the bottom line is that Star Trek does it wrong, right? In oh. order for... Excuse yeah, me. I know. Excuse me. I know, I know. How I know what I just said. Dare you. I know what I just said. You I take that back right now. Take that back you right take now. Take it back! <laughs> Star Trek is completely correct in the Star Trek universe. Star Trek, when it uh -huh. comes to warp speed and time dilation, is not correct when it comes to our understanding of the theory of relativity. So they, you're saying they shouldn't age while they're doing their high warp maneuvers. Right. What, right. what should be happening, the problem is, you see, the high warp maneuvers are faster than the speed of light. Yes. And right. if an object moves through our current space at faster than the speed of light, then right. it can violate causality. Yes. And so right. that whole aspect of relativity and so forth is necessary to make sure that the arrow of time and the way that we uh, know, understand history and the changing of the universe stays okay. Right. The so causes when, occur before events. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. When you have a Rather circumstance than after like, <laughs> right, when yeah. you have a circumstance like warp speed, right? That goes out the window. This object, because it's in a subspace bubble, Right, right by right. the Alcubierre drive or whatever, it mm -hmm. goes through so fast that it can actually outrace a radio signal to a distant star. And so you can tell something that happened before the radio signal was even arriving, which means that you violate causality. The way that they get around that problem is to say that communications also, also goes faster go than speed subspace. Of light. Right, right. So you know those subspace communications and so forth, right? And what that means is that I can still radio ahead, not with a radio though, but with something that's going faster than my spaceship is going, which is faster than the speed of light at that moment. And therefore causality is not violated because all information that in I that get before and after in retained. that subspace is retained. Got it. Right. Okay. So okay. bottom line is, as soon as you throw in these fanciful ideas of how to go faster than light, then you have to assume that your communications also go faster than light and that the right. light is no longer a speed limit for objects in the universe. Therefore, causality can be preserved right. because you have everything. So am I correct that that's why the wormhole works as uh, it, with, without that violation? Because you're not actually going faster than the speed of light, moving through the medium of space time. Right, right, right. You're it seems to me a, a wormhole should it. be just clean. A clean just step a clean, through. Clean yeah. step through. Yes, except that wormholes at the moment have not been determined to exist. No, no. So, but wait, well, Rick, they are in, in the Star, Star Trek. And in Rick the Star has Trek wormholes. universe. Rick right. has wormholes. Uh, Doctor Strange has wormholes. Don't tell me we don't have wormholes. Oh, we have wormholes. <laughs> Does the universe have wormholes? Okay, I love fine. all those wormholes. But uh, yes, do we have one right now? That's that's from okay. It's faster than Rick light and Morty. It's good enough for Rick and Morty. It's good enough for me. That's right, yeah. Morty. Uh, that's we right. gotta take a. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Chuck. Did we really need the the, the drunken burp? Was, was that really necessary? Yeah, you can't do Rick without it. 
Without a break. All right, we're, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more Star Talk special edition with our geek in chief, Charles Lee on Star Talk. We're back, Star Talk special edition. We got some queries coming in from the ether. And uh, uh, we're, by that, we're defining our Patreon support as <laughs> a the population ether. in the ether <laughs> yes. sending us queries. And this is a grab bag edition, and we need backup for that, of course, every time. And that's Charles Liu. So thanks for being here, Charles. <laughs> My pleasure. So who's next? Happy, who's got the Who's got the next query coming? All right. Uh, next up is Manny Baez from New York City. All, All right. my life, I've always thought there is some connection from these three subjects: time, universe, and dreams. Ooh. Ooh. Like as in one is dependent on the other in order to unlock the center of this pyramid for answers. It may be that the answer can be a combination of science and philosophy, but do you think this pyramid of subjects has anything to do with answering questions such as the value of life or why we exist? Whoa. In this universe. Whoa. Manny, deep I, dive. A, what a wonderful question. And yep. and linking, you know, linking the the universe with some sort of metaphysics is something that has been done since the very beginning. Yep. In fact, Neil will tell you that in the history of science, until such time as there was a true separation between empirical science and metaphysics, it was called natural philosophy. And we were always trying to philosophize until people like Galileo said, you know what? I don't think we should really mix like how beautiful is a tree or, or how righteous is a star. Let's just talk about the tree and the star and then worry about the philosophy separately. Yeah, in so fact, the, pretty- Newton's most famous book, uh, which we call Principia, the full title of that is Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Ah, and so the natural well philosophy is part of that framing. Great of, point, right. Yeah. So your, your ideas are great, Manny. They're right on target. And what I would say is the following. As far as we know right now, human dreams are limited in our existence, our perception. There is no evidence yet that our dreams are actually connected with the rest of the universe. That's the key here in terms of tying them together. For us and for our existence, dreams and time and the universe are linked. But is it true for anything else in the universe? Do we know, for example, do pets dream? I know sometimes we think that dogs are dreaming when they're jumping around and they seem very happy when they're sleeping and things like that. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing, Chuck, exactly. Chuck, good sign. Good job. Very good. That's, that's like right, too Charles, good, actually. Charles, let me, let me throw this at you. Sure. Premonitions. Yes. You can't get the future before you're out of the present. Well. But I've, this, had, a, I've had premonitions that have come true. Right. Everybody. So that's well, the future before right. in, in the present. And, so and how, how it, does that Or connect? is it, wait a minute, or is it a convergence of the past and all of your past that, bec- that converges on one moment because mm-hmm. the surroundings uh, inform you in such a way that you say, oh, this is going to happen. And so it appears to you that it has already happened, but really it's just your vast past experience coming together in one point pre another event. (laughs) Well Um, said. Can I explain one thing? Uh, I'm 19 years of age. I have not played in my football club's first 11, right? So I'm I'm a way off of that. Um, And about 10 days before it actually happens. Mm -hmm. I have a dream. I'm running towards my own goal. I'm in the center of the field and I get punched in my left cheek. (laughs) Wow. Random. Random. So I'm playing in my full debut about 10 days later. I'm running towards my own goal in the center of the field. I get punched in my left cheek. I'm like, you are kidding me. Yellow card? Red card? No, carried on. Carried on. Back. Yeah, we played a different game back then. It was more rollerball. <laughs> oh, man. But for that to be part and parcel okay. of that dream way ahead of time was just so random. It's so uncanny, random. right? Well, here, here is the point, right? We have not yet been able to scientifically confirm whether mm-hmm. these things are random or whether they are actually connected. Think about it this way. The human brain is essentially designed to make predictions of the future. Right. We are spending our entire existences from the early days, right, 
we predict that if that lion over there will come after me in this direction, therefore I will run in that direction. We predict later on, right, that the stock market will go up, therefore we will invest, right? These predictions do not always come true. In fact, they rarely mm. come true, but there are thousands of them. The brain is a prediction generator. So could it have been that your brain in its generation of predictions, which dreams to some extent are, right, go on and had so many predictions in your lifetime that just that one random one came true just by chance. And you remember the hits and you forget the misses. You forget the misses. Yeah. I knew the, I, I knew which stadium I was in mm -hmm. and it was just it right. was just as dreaded. So, so it's know, really it's, remarkable that way too. And then yeah. there's a second factor, which I only recently learned from my psychologist friends. Apparently, we humans will adjust our memories to match backwards. Yes. Right. We humans actually have a, a, it's hard to know whether it's a defect or whether it's a reality truth thing. Well, if we, you're a black man, it's a defect. No. <laughs> Just we saying. Every time we remember things, our mm. brain is recreating the memory. Right. It's drawing it out. It's not like a typical, say, computer where it comes right. out and brings out a perfect copy. It's it not, goes a, it's not a, a movie camera. It's right. not a movie it goes camera. through a lot of filters and it resets things. And people wind up misremembering, not on purpose, not to be lying, mm. but their brains have actually shifted what they thought was real from the past. Right. So could it be that when you got hit in the face and yeah. maybe you know it was similar to feeling being hit in the face in the dream, your brain set it up so that thinking back to the dream, it wound up matching the two pieces and getting them confused. It is possible. And again, like I said, so many of you things are speculation, and it's mm. hard for us to establish what is actually scientifically causal or the case, but that does happen. And Here's part of the ago, problem, Gary, is that you didn't write that down when you had the dream. That's part of the challenge here of verifying it scientifically. So mm. that leaves whatever your dream was susceptible to exactly what Charles is saying about when you recover the dream. So, well, this was bang on to exactly what happened. Well, the dream the dream was about 10 days before the actual right. event happened. Yeah, you should so just write down your dreams helpful. every yeah. single day. Yeah. And okay. 999 times, it won't come true. And one time it comes true, yeah, you can't so then I, claim got, special I got to get me a dream diary. <laughs> exactly. also, it, also, it's pretty reasonable that um, uh, you could have a dream about getting hit in the face while playing soccer and get hit in the face. <laughs> no, it's it's not it's not that common. It's right. not that common oh, okay. in those situations it for then. it to happen. No, 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 uh -huh. that's fine, right. Chuck. Back, you, you know, I don't, I don't, know, about, I don't know enough yeah. about soccer so, to be honest. No. So to I guess to wrap up Manny's question, you know, mm. the idea is basically to say dreams definitely affect human experience mm. and how humans interact with the universe. Mm. Does the rest of the universe, however, sense those dreams or react as a result of them? That is something we don't know. Probably not. Yeah, it's a, it's know. a, it's a very probably not. <clears throat> but you know, people still claim it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 listen, it informs a lot of people on what they do. So there is a significance there, no matter what, That's because right. there are a lot of people who are reacting to their lives based upon you know that what they think is that information. But I right. and by the way, there's another thing, Charles. I think. Uh, a dream, as you know, is a neurosynaptic firings of your brain. Yes, yes. And should that be fundamentally different from deep thoughts you might be having while you're not asleep? So mm -hmm. so what I find int intriguing is <clears throat> almost every movie that shows somebody who, by some bolt of lightning or through drugs, becomes insanely brilliant, mm. yeah. okay? Like the movie Lucy. Right. Or the mm -hmm. one phenomenon, I think it yeah. was. Oh, the, oh yeah. those kind of drugs. Oh, okay. The, okay, no, no, no. <laughs> in those movies, in every one of them, the person can control things with their brain. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm intrigued by that because if they're just really smarter, they should just simply solve problems faster or better. Right. And they, they somehow the urge in the storytelling is to have the power of the brain jump out of itself. Right. And, and then manipulate, man manipulate physical objects in your environment. In almost every case, that's the power they give them. But from the smartest person on earth to the dumbest person on earth, neither of them can move stuff in front of them without touching them. 
So to say, let's make the smart person even smarter. Now they can spin tops and 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 float objects. Mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't get it. However, the truly smart people know how to get other people to move stuff for them. So... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pick that up. Pick that up. <laughs> please pick that please, up. Please oh, yeah, pick that up. Thank you. Right. 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 Give me another question. Chuck, what do you have? Right. Here we go. This is Camilla Kaftal, who says, hello, Dr. Lou and Dr. Tyson. Camilla here from Baltimore, Maryland. Right. How is the cosmic microwave background temperature so constant everywhere in the universe when there are hot stars like our sun? How? Huh? Oh, oh, conspiracy! Beautiful conspiracy. question. Oh, <laughs> oh Charles. Temperature, temperature. Take oh, that no. one, Charles. Camilla, you've asked a great question, which sometimes astronomers don't do a good job of explaining outward. The cosmic microwave background does get contaminated by foreground objects. So if we were just measuring, like, say, for example, the WMAP satellite or the COPE satellite did, the cosmic microwave energy that's reaching us from the cosmos, right? What will happen is that we will pick up the stars in the front, the galaxy that is we're in, and the cosmic microwave background in the back. The trick that astronomers do, and it's not a trick, it's really hard work, is actually getting rid of that foreground signal. So your insight is exactly right, Camilla. The cosmic microwave background is contaminated. In is fact, changed. there was a result that reported some new discovery in the cosmic background. And it was later found that they did not properly remove the effects of our galaxy. Correct. And that so, happens a lot. It's, yeah. like the erase, it's like the erase feature on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> foreground contamination is actually one of the things in astronomy that we have to worry about much more than say a typical laboratory physicist. Uh, they can, try to remove as much of the foreground as possible, but we're stuck looking through the gas and the dust and the stars yeah. and the galaxies. Yeah, we can't and change our angle of view. Cool. Yeah. 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 We can't change it, but we Very like cool. it. You know, Very yeah, cool. Fun stuff. Out. Thank Great you. Question. Yeah. Gary, what do you got? Okay. Kyle M. Um, if a black hole is infinitely dense, why are some bigger than others? Mm. Mm. Good question. Answer, please. Uh, first of all, Kyle, you know, it's not always about size, okay? That's number one. <laughs> oh, well, I, that sounds like somebody <laughs> might need some size. I, I, I don't know. Oh, Chuck, Chuck I, I'll, 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 I'll leave you uh, yeah. to ponder that one. Uh, here's the story, okay? A, a black hole is not infinitely dense. The only part of a black hole that's infinitely dense is its singularity. Uh-huh. See, a black hole the event horizon that surrounds it, the edge, shall we say, of the black hole, contains a certain amount of mass. Mm -hmm. Within that container, Mm -hmm. the average mass is always less than infinite. It is just in the spot where we think exists, the singularity, where the density is infinite. So now here's the question. Wait, 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 just to be clear, just to be clear. So when we describe the size of a black hole, Uh it's the size of the event horizon just for practical purposes to describe how big things are. But the matter is deep within. Normally, we think of the size of the Earth as the edge of the matter of the Earth. But the black hole, we just go to the event horizon, and we're happy right. with that. Okay. Right. We do not know what's inside. We don't, we don't how know. It's distributed. So Correct. if that's the case, right, mm-hmm. it means that if it were a star at one point, I'm, ta- I'm not talking about a supermassive at the center of a galaxy. I'm sure. talking about just a star that collapses in on itself. Mm-hmm. We know that that star had a certain mass before it collapsed in upon itself. So Correct. if it had a certain mass before it collapsed in upon itself, how can the density of that mass become infinite at one single point if it started mm-hmm. off with a finite mass? The mass itself doesn't become infinite, but the density becomes infinite. Okay. Right? So, right. for example, uh, mass, let's say something is is the, the, the weight of my head or something. Mm-hmm. If I squish my head very small, Right. Uh, as a black hole would do if I fall into it, right? Uh, it would become more dense, but not more massive. Okay. It would still take the same amount of energy 
or force to lift my head. All right. But you would need a smaller container. Why so are you using your head wait, as an example? Uh, what, what? No, man. This is morbid, uh, that, Chuck. I was going to say, that was a painful uh, <laughs> example. It just popped into my head. What <laughs> can a, I say? Use a watermelon or something, uh, you know. <laughs> so now, wait a minute. I don't man. have a head for those kinds of jokes. So. Uh-huh. Hey. So, so Chuck Lou, Chuck Lou, here's the deal. Yes. So, yes. Uh, if that's the case, how yes. can something become infinitely smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller at some point, doesn't it have to just be so tightly compact that it can't get any smaller? Great question, Chuck. And in fact, it is the people who study matter, mostly quantum physicists, who say that, yes, there must be a limit. But when Albert Einstein established the general theory of relativity, he did not see a limit. He, did not, he was not happy with the fact that the mathematical equations of space-time allowed for the existence of these singularities. That's why they're called singularities, right? Because they they don't follow the mathematical rules that you would expect for uh, the space. It's where God is dividing by zero. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> you never heard that one? No, oh, that's, that's an interesting point. That is crazy. But it's, it's kind of, it's kind mm. of, yeah, Neil is right. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. You're dividing by zero. You're creating something that, should not exist. If you've never done but that before, do, it, do it on your calculator. See what happens. But can can you then make this thing that's reducing inside mm-hmm. disappear altogether? Or does Don't it know. reappear somewhere else? Don't know. The current hypotheses suggest that black holes are not, say, tears in space-time, in which case the matter or the mass would flow mm. from one point to another, but rather a kind of like a, like a hernia in space-time, mm. a, a water balloon where the mass goes in and kind of collects in a space or a time or something that's not part of the space time we have access to. And then over many, many trillions and trillions of years, slowly gets expended outward again through a process called Hawking radiation. So check it out because Neil said, do it. I just divide it by zero or my, so the first time I did it, I did zero by divided by zero. And it said invalid format, please do not do. And then the second, <laughs> and then the second time I put one divided by zero and it said, can't divide by zero. And then the third time I did it and it went, no. <laughs> and the, the fourth time you did it said, I already told you no. no I told you. <laughs> Go to your room. <laughs> uh, go to your room. But but it's the examination of these singularities and unusual points in the equations of space time that have led to these amazing discoveries and thought processes like black holes, like the Big Bang, like those kinds of things that we're wondering about today that fire our imagination. All right. All right. All right we got to take another quick break. When we come back, okay. the third and final segment of Star Talk Special Edition with our geek in chief, Charles Lewis. We're back for the third and final segment of Star Talk Special Edition with Chuck Nice, Gary O'Reilly, and you know. Geek in Chief, Charles Liu. Charles, how do we find you on the internet? Oh, well, I am at Chuck Liu, C H U C K L I U. And you can find me on the Luniverse channel, uh, just chatting about general things. There's the podcast, and there's also various equipment and there's also various content that we talk about in there, share with all the people who follow. Okay, it's always cool. a pleasure to do that. I mean, yeah. other kind of fun content, posted content. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Let's go to the next question. This special edition, Cosmic Queries. Who's new okay. All these questions. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. All these questions from our Patreon audience. So uh, thank you very much for your mm-hmm. curiosity. Craig Cordwell from the UK. Please, can you briefly explain how it is more efficient and easier to launch a rocket going directly up rather than taking off oh. similar to an airplane does? Uh, so answers, please. Mm. Uh, well, uh, now, Gary, it, could you please do that again, but do it in Craig Codwell's accent? Because <laughs> you're both Brits. Let's hear it. Okay, I don't well, know what part of I don't, I don't know what part of the UK. How, how about Craig if you from Cornwall? I, well, I might be from Liverpool. Cornwall. Cornwall? Yorkshire. Craig from Kernew here. Please, can you briefly explain who it is more of? Oh, it's how embarrassing. Oh. Sorry, Craig. Because okay. he might be, he, he might be from Glasgow. And in which case, oh, it's very, true. very different. Or he oh. could be a scouse, you know, he oh. could be a scouse, yes. or he could be all sorts of things. So the, the answer to the question actually is that we do try to launch our rockets horizontally. When you see on the launch pad a rocket going upward vertically, 
the only reason it tries to go up first is because it's trying to build up speed because it will then start curling sideways. It starts moving horizontally because the best way to get into orbit or out of the gravitational well of a planet is to travel at a tangent, not straight up vertically. It's only up vertically to get off of the ground, away from the launch pad, over mountains and so forth. And then the trajectory starts to curl, right? That's why, for example, we launch from Florida because it goes up for a short while and then goes horizontally over the Atlantic Ocean. So our sense that we launch vertically is actually just those first few seconds of our perception. Later on, if you want to go further and further upward while you're in orbit, you move tangentially, you move horizontally. And that actually has been shown mathematically and, and engineering wise to be the most efficient way to gain altitude up in space. Once you're outside of the slowing down effects of the atmosphere uh, of the Earth. So, Charles, here's something amazing. You ready? Yes. Go ahead. The exact trajectory of a rocket. Do you know what yeah. it is? It's, it's an exact trajectory. Do you know? I'll tell you what it is. Uh... It is... It is the it is the inverted the, the physically inverted solution to the Brachistochrone problem. No kidding. Yes. Wow. Yes. I was going to guess catenary, but Brachistochrone no, no, makes catenary, much more sense. It's way. Think about yeah, it. it. Makes much more sense. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah, yeah. telling you, it makes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of course, the ice cream cone problem. Everybody knows that. <laughs> mm -hmm. that yeah. Mm -hmm. So here, there was a there was a was it Bernoulli. Someone posed a some famous uh, mathematician of of from the 19th century posed mm -hmm. the question. Might have been the 18th century. Posed the question: If I have a ball up here and I wanted to get down over down, but over to the right a little, what path should I take? Should I put a plank connecting the two of them and roll it down? Will that get there faster than if it drops first? And then curls around at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there a shape? Is there an arc that I could drop this ball? We'll get to that point at a lower elevation the fastest. Mm -hmm. This turned out to be a very hard problem. And it is not the straight line. Right. There is a curve where it builds up speed falling. And then that speed gets forward, moves it forward very quickly. And the minimization of that is a, we, you learn this in advanced mechanics, right? And I think that's when I did, uh, Charles. We, uh, what what class did you learn that? I think I was, I might have learned. I think it. I think we we got it as a bonus from my uh, calculus. Yeah, professor. yeah, yeah. My calculus teacher in high school, brilliant man. And in fact, went on to write some really great books, you know, review books about calculus. And he would throw in just these little things, uh, yeah, just like, oh, by the way, you know, <laughs> and that's what kind of made math class cooler because. Math can be just like learning grammar or learning punctuation or learning vocabulary. And learn extra little but, tricks and tricks right. and fun, fun but things. But when you put them into like, hey, was this useful in some way? Was this a thing that you actually find out? You know, those are the opportunities where you make connections and go, aha, this math stuff is cool. You right, bring guys, it to life, guys, Charles. Guys, you totally we have bring it to life. Right. from the ice cream cone principle. <laughs> no. <laughs> we On need purpose. To know no, no, no. <laughs> we haven't diverged. We've, we've embraced it, Chuck. Okay. As Gary just said, it brings it to life. Bring now I bet there are thousands of people out in the podcast first that are wondering, what's the ice cream cone problem? And now they're going to look it up. And now they're going to learn math which is based on ice cream because they like it. It livens up the subject. It makes I, 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 say, I, I, oh, what is the ice just... cream cone problem? You said that uh, no the, sprinkles. In, the exact inverse of a trajectory of a rocket oh, oh, what, is the exact a... inverse of the ice cream cone Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I was not. No, <laughs> the Brachistochrone problem. Oh, bra oh, 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 excuse me, the Brachistochrone. Not which the is, ice cream cone. Which is very much like um, uh, cookies and cream. <laughs> What's a new flavor? There is, the there is actually there's it's a actually new Ben and Jerry's. Chris, <laughs> let me tell you something, Neil. If they ever give you a Ben and Jerry's ice cream, you the better Christocone. name it Bacrista Cream. <laughs> 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 but my only point actually, is th this: this math exercise is yeah, yeah. designed to find the fastest minimum energy path That's awesome. between these two points. Right, and, and it's so the 
So the minimum, no, just down and and to the point. Mm, you okay. take that, flip it up. It is the minimum, minimum. energy expenditure into orbit. Because if you go up too high first, you wasted too much energy gaining altitude. Gotcha. If you go downwind first, you're wasting too much energy trying to go, trying horizontal. To go horizontal. So it's the it's the perfect uh, inversion of that problem. That's yeah, why it's great. Is there yeah. a way to launch by spinning? Oh, and then yeah. launching I, that I'll, way. This this is actually a startup company. I heard about this. Um, yeah. Just recently, yeah. a startup company. Would you like, to buy, my, would you like to buy my shares? Crank no, no, no. Up Charles, I know a screw. Go, go. <laughs> yes, it's, yes. it's a, it's yeah, a, right. it's a. They want to spin yes. something to high to mm -hmm. launch speeds. Right. Yep, there you go. Right. And and then so then they're not even using it. a rocket. It's just yeah, no. It's, it's right. like what's what's this? The, what the, would be the equivalent of when you space. put the astronaut in the centrifuge type thing? It's like an old-fashioned, spin it. Yeah. like a medieval catapult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like no, a medieval you, you catapult. Could not, you could not throw an astro. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a, like it's a, a medieval catapult. It but spins around and then releases at a certain. You can't point. send an astro. Right, you can't send an astronaut in there though. The the insides will turn to jelly. I mean, oh, they're gonna real. leave the catapult mm. at like a thousand miles an hour. You know, just like sudden. Ooh, you know, the the G forces will, you, will you will, you will right. be you. really. It would be too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, so damn. so you're sending like payloads. So, that but it's about it's about thing. payloads. But this is yeah. still a development process. Oh, yeah. but but oh, that's that I mean, say. okay. So if you've got so, no innards to explode <laughs> or into <laughs> jelly, right? Then it's everything fine. Does this have does this have a commercial? It, it could. In yeah, terms you don't use a rocket to put stuff into right. space. Yeah. You know, well, the not, the it has it has been thought for a long time that the easiest way or the least energy way to get payloads up into space is just create a tether, basically an elevator going from ground Stay away to, to thousands heaven, of Charles. miles in the air and just go up, 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 and Stay away that'd to be heaven. great. But Stay away to so heaven. let me ask yeah. you this: well, there are how, two ways. I mean, you can go back, but in the long run, I mean, it's still time to change the road you're on. Is jet fuel cheaper than rocket fuel? At the moment, yes, by okay. a lot. So then why is it that we were transporting the shuttle when it's here on Earth by piggybacking it on a on the back of a big jet, but we wouldn't put it into space by piggybacking it up to the highest uh, altitude possible, detaching it, and then letting it just fire rockets to go into space? Because the atmosphere um, is a lot thinner and you got a lot, lot less uh, space to go. That kind of strategy is actually what was done in the early rocket planes, in the early spacecraft. Oh, okay. In fact, some, some spacecraft now, for example, I think one of the commercial spacecraft done by some billionaire or another, right, reaches space by doing precisely that. You carry some sort of a rocket on some sort of a plane, and then you let the rocket go. And then the rocket takes it the rest of the way. Let's try to get a couple more questions in here before our third and final segment ends. Who's next? All right, I'll jump in with this one because uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, back to Star Trek, just as a spoiler. Connor Holm, um, in Star Trek, what is your favorite example of a scientific prediction slash concept that actually became true but wasn't proven at the time? Ooh, I know my answer, but Ooh. I want to hear everybody else's answer. First. I have an answer, but I don't know if it would, I don't know if it, it fits. Really? But, okay, so yeah. here's here's my answer. My favorite thing that has come true is the communicator. Yeah. Indeed, mm. all we have to do today is to pick up a something a little rectangular and say, Scotty. Mm -hmm. Right? And okay. Scotty can hear you. Yes, Captain. Oh, sorry, that's Cheka. Uh, uh, same, same, same idea. Get your accent right? straight, yes. dude. Yeah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're worse than me. I... <laughs> In fact, our communicators are way more advanced than anything they than anything Star they Trek, in Star ever Trek. Had. Right, correct, That's correct. Uh, okay, that uh, when by he just the way, touches the badge. Happy just touches his Starfleet badge, right. and all of a sudden mm -hmm. he opens up comms. Yeah, that we, sort of touch, that touch activity on smartphones that we that didn't exist at the time that now does. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Okay, it's amazing. Mine would be talking to your computer, and the computer talks back, which oh, is their, nice. their form of nice. uh, artificial intelligence. Computer, please tell me, nice. and then the computer would give you information. Yeah. So, and we have that today. Like that's nice. not science fiction Voice anymore. Voice recognition. That's a great point. Right. That's Very a great good point. point. Right. Okay. And they don't use keyboards, right? No, that's not a thing. Can. Yeah. 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 No. Is it my turn here? Go ahead. Yes, yes, it is. But Gary, did you give your answer? I did. That. 
you touch the Starfleet badge and all of oh, a sudden the the badge, badge touch so it's just touch. Badge just touching. Touch so I have two answers. One, which I never thought would ever happen, happened. We can just walk up to a door and it will open. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, even then That's you could right. go to a That's supermarket. No, 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 no. The supermarkets of the day, they have a pad, had a the touch pad. And you step on the pad, it would complete a circuit, and that okay. would open the door. Okay. But there were no pads. They would just walk up, and the door just somehow knew that they were there. <laughs> That's because there I were two that. guys on either side of the door. <laughs> Going, yeah. Shh, shh. <laughs> Post-production must have had a blast with that show. Uh, so I, I was, I said, I believe the photon torpedoes, the aliens, <laughs> the warp drive, <laughs> but door opening just by walking up to it, never. <laughs> okay. That was my first one. Another one, I don't think it was developed yet, even if the science was there, and maybe they wouldn't have known about it, but they have this machine that instantly heats food, which is basically oh, yes. a modern the I replicator. Think it also, replicator. I, I, well, I don't know if it's a replicator or it's just something that makes the hot food. I mean, the replicator doesn't necessarily heat it, right? So there's this this cavity. Where so I want some chicken soup. They push a button and hot chicken chicken soup comes oh, out. Okay, yeah. right. I, I count that like as a microwave oven. That's the original Star Trek, yeah. I know, but is that not a precursor to 3D printing? Ooh. Well, the replicator Ooh. is a precursor. Yeah, the I mean, replicator, I would the say. The replicator yeah. would be the 3D yeah. printing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So that's yeah. that's that's, that's yeah. another one that we've got to wow. consider as well. And you know, oh, there was geez. a big prize. Was it an X Prize even that was announced? For uh, the tricorder? The tricorder, yes. Yes. Tell everybody about that. Oh, well, tricorder was the thing that Bones waved over somebody and figured out exactly what was wrong with them medically. I'm a doctor, so, not a computer technician. <laughs> right. I'm a doctor, not a fill in the blank. Right? right. So the whole point was that if we somehow could do the same through uh, remote sensing, right. just yeah. wave something over somebody and get all kinds of things, vital signs, things like that. Okay. We're getting close already, actually. Yeah. For example, now we can take people's temperatures without touching them. Just right, that little right, thing, and then right. you get the radio, you know, the infrared off of the surface. That was a NASA NASA thing, by the way. That's right. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a tricorder so, to work, would you need to have certain implants in the body? Oh, would it would allow, help, but it would not be necessary. To be, he's, he's lucky you're just scanning a code then, aren't you? That's right. Uh, yeah. That would be very useful, but it would not be necessary. It, the whole okay. point of the tricorder is that you can just diagnose what's wrong just by remote sensing. Yeah. And but, you know, we're really close do. already because we're using light. So, the, the, you know, a lot of these instrumentations yeah. uses light mm -hmm. to actually get the reading from the body. So, so Charles, so there are two kinds of, of, of tools then. One of them is receiving whatever your body is giving it. Mm -hmm. So if your body is like radiating a little warmer, you see that extra high temperature. It's infrared. a passive receipt. Passive. But another one, maybe you'd have to like have the person walk in front of x-rays and then <laughs> the, the, it reads something right. that you've actually yeah. put through the body. Right. right. No, the doctor. The Doppler radar for weather forecasting, for example, you do that. You send a radar pulse down to the ground, it comes back up. And depending on what it's like when it comes back up, what the time delay is, how strong it is, and things like that, you know whether there were clouds, whether it's raining, whether it's right. clear. Or how, like how much rain there was even. Yeah. Right. Yeah. By the same yeah. token, maybe it can send some sort of pulse, a harmless piece of information, uh, radiation mm -hmm. down through the body or onto the skin. When it bounces back, it can read the results and see, ah, yes, this person has a skin infection of right. this kind Look on their you know, that part of their skin, and therefore we need to... Cut off their arm. <laughs> oh, no, no. Anyhow, guys, we're out of time. Oh, but no. that's a good, that's a good question to end on. That was fun. Very good. Star Talk Special Edition with the one and only Charles Lou. Charles, thanks for coming in for this. Uh, Always a pleasure. Champion. Thank you so much. Returning, cha returning champion. <laughs> Undisputed. <laughs> Geek in chief, Charles You Lou. guys are too kind. Thank you All so right, much. Star Talk Special Edition. Signing out. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Keep looking up.